Welcome, Patrick, to this year's 2020 inaugural Resilience Conference. I'm glad to have you here. Um, before we start, would you like to introduce yourself? Yeah, Zach, Patrick Sells. I'm the Chief Innovation Officer at Quantic Bank. Quantic is headquartered in New York City, but we have customers in all 50 states. And where are you calling in from today? You're not in New York City, are you? No, I'm in San Diego. I've uh, kind of temporarily relocated here. I'm enjoying working on the beach most days. That's awesome. And so um, I know uh, we've spoken before, and I know that you bring sort of a fresh perspective to, to banking. Can you talk about your background and how you got into this role? Sure. I started a company when I was actually in college doing digital marketing, probably the easiest way to understand it. But really what we focused on was helping companies develop new products or channels or serve a new customer using the internet somehow. So oftentimes it was e-commerce or something like that and lots of digital marketing websites. But I actually never worked for a bank, um, despite trying to get a bank client. And I think now I know why, because I, don't, I didn't understand all the regulations and what it means to be a bank. But I think with that as eight, nine years of experience, I was able to work in quite a few different industries and understand lots of different cultures and way things have worked. And I've been able to kind of bring that, I think, into banking, if you will. How have you met that, that kind of tension? Have you brought sort of that, that freshness of outside perspective and moved banking towards you? Or have you had to sort of move towards banking? I think I've probably moved towards banking in some ways. But ultimately, and this kind of gets to the root of innovation. I, when I think about innovation, it's not synonymous with technology, though oftentimes technology is a part of innovation. It's really about being able to reframe certain things and say, what are these assumptions that are, exist around me, good or bad, and to think about changing those very fundamental assumptions. And so I've been doing that inside of a bank, but definitely have come to appreciate and understand and actually really value what it means to be a regulated bank and how to do it to, in, in concert with each other. Sure, that makes a lot of sense. So can you take us back, I guess, to the, <clears throat> the early days of, of, of the pandemic and sort of what the conversation was like internally? Like, when did you guys start to know, like, hey, there's something really major here? And sort of what were your first steps? Like, how did you go about solving for that? Yeah, I think like a lot of New Yorkers at first, um, people were kind of opinionated about what is COVID and does it matter? And is it really going to impact us? And others were very much more on the nervous side. And I, I probably put myself in that category. Um, and then I think right before we actually locked down in New York, we felt this growing sense of this was likely to happen. And we, what would happen if, you know, if all of our employees had to work from home, we weren't set up for that as a bank. And would we be able to get enough laptops even and get them to people's homes? And so we made the decision 24 or 48 hours actually before the state would lock down to send all of our employees home. And the team was able to execute that in 24 hours flawlessly. And then when the orders came, we were kind of, you know, business as usual, if you will, in many ways. But I do think being in New York, um, especially being out here in San Diego now, it felt very different. In those first couple of months, it was very scary. Um, you know, we didn't know if the world was going to end. We knew people were getting sick and people who were sick, who were, you know, and then people who were dying. And um, it was a very stressful and scary time. Um, and so what did you, when it went during that fear, I guess, and the unknown in the beginning, like what did you guys fall back on to help you make sort of tough decisions to move forward? Like what, where were your touch points? Where, were, where was your home base? It really, I think for us, it really was our culture. Um, you know, I think culture is something that I know we've talked about before and it really can be a way to drive your business forward. And that's definitely how we have thought about culture as a means by which to grow and guide the business. But I think what we saw was that culture became a fantastic, you know, kind of fabric of resilience right, the very talk of the name of this talk, it uniquely helped us come together and stay together and navigate this world. And I think today we've come out even stronger than when we started. So, so let's drill down into that. Obviously, that's the topic here at hand. Um, I want to know, I guess, how, how, how do you think of culture? What is culture? And, and I guess as a co corollary to that, like, what is Quantix culture? Yeah, it's a great question. It's something we spent, I personally spent a lot of time thinking about. And I think, you know, one of the analogies that I would use to kind of understand culture, and it's helped, been instrumental for my own kind of guiding my thinking, if you will, is that culture in a way becomes the identity of a business. And if you think about, well, what's the identity of business? 
that's not an easy question to answer. It's a bit abstract. And so we moved it to the analogy of a person and said, can we learn something and understand the identity of humans, of us? And so if I take you, for example, your heart has to pump profit every day. Or <laughs> your heart has to pump blood for you to live, for you to exist. Oh, you pump profit. <laughs> that we all do, right? <laughs> and the Cuban. Um, but if you know your heart has to pump blood, and if it ever stops pumping blood, then you, Zach, no longer exist. Well, the analogy in business, businesses have to pump profit. If they don't, they don't exist unless you're a tech startup. But you have to be pumping profit. But it, you, Zach, are so much more than just a blood pumper. There's your personality. It's what makes you you. It's what makes you so fun, right? If, if, I was, if we all lived in a world where we didn't see each other as anything more than blood pumpers, it'd be like walking around in the apocalypse and we're all zombies, and unfortunately, that's what's happened to business is it's just all about pumping profit and, the, and fails to be all that it could be. And so, okay, so what does that mean now about culture? Fundamentally, we look at culture around kind of three key tenets that it needs to have. One is this idea of a shared language, right? And so I think when we think about like, again, even at an individual level, there are certain words that you use that maybe I don't use, right? And then you extrapolate up to say that of a family. You know, for example, I remember on my grandparents' 50th anniversary, we were hiking in Colorado and my three-year-old cousin starts to complain and my 10-year-old cousin turns around and says, suck it up, buttercup. And that phrase, suck it up, buttercup, two, day, two decades later is still used by my family all the time. And it represents a part of us that we all are hard workers, but it's unique, right? And I can get a text from a cousin I haven't seen in years and it immediately brings warmth and understanding and, you know, the sense of connected connection. So now shared language inside the business, what does that look like? For us, we chose to use our core values as that. And we developed four of them that are unique to us and they're true of us. And they're ones that we don't ever want to change. And those are know the goal, try it on progress, not perfection and say cheese. And these are phrases that embody who we hire and how we promote people, but also it guides the day-to-day -day of life at Quantic. Um, and we can stop and talk about those if you want, or I can keep talking about the other tenets. Let's go with the other tenets and come back to those four core values. So in this idea of identity or culture, right, we see this idea for a shared language. And then the phrase I would use is decentralized decision-making. In other words, how can you have get an organization so that anyone at any level knows the answer, how to answer yes or no to the most critical questions, right? You obviously can't do that for everything, but if everyone can be working in concert, and again, I, you looked at my life and said, where, where, do I, where can I find an analogy in this? And so I've got a group of friends who live in Austin, Texas, for example, and there's probably eight or nine of them. And I know that on any Friday or Saturday night, they will not be watching the movie, right? It doesn't matter if they're all together or subgroups, this is just not a movie crowd, right? And they all kind of know how to make decisions like this. Whereas I have another group of friends in Indianapolis who I know on a Friday, Saturday night, they love to watch movies together, right? And again, it's kind of this unspoken way of being able to make decisions. And so in business and for us, we use three strategic anchors that you have to be able to answer yes to any of, to two out of the three for us to be able to do it. And if you, the answer is no, then we want to stop. And so those three are innovative deposits, adaptive lending and maximum leverage. And then the, the last component I think in culture or the identity of business is a mission. What is that guiding thing that's kind of bigger than you that can everyone can rally behind, right? And we all have this again personally, there's something we really want to do and it almost doesn't even matter if we get there, it just, it drives us, right? I wanted to go to college, I wanted to open my own business, I wanted to live in Europe, I wanted to have a family. And again, you can go from the individual level up, extrapolate to a group, and you see this again play out. And I think religion's probably the best analogy there. It's why religions have lasted for so long. It's not about any one person, but there's this thing that unites people to say, there is something bigger than me. And so a business has to have that too. And this is a pretty easy one, right? You need to have a mission statement. Ours is to break the system for financial empowerment. And so I think in this idea of the culture and how we think about it, we wanted to have a, we needed to have a shared language. We needed to be able to decentralize the most important decisions and we needed an overarching mission. And I think those apply for any company, 
And you know, that's how we think about culture and this, what I call the identity of business. That's a really interesting framework. So can we take that and then drill down into, I guess you call them core values, four core values? Yeah. 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 So we have four core values. Um, the first one's progress, not perfection. So what we mean by that is we want to be, we don't, for us, there is no destination of perfection. The destination is to be in a constant state of progress, mm -hmm. right? And I think, especially in banking, we are held to perfection, if you will, by the regulators. So it's not that we don't care about results, but we don't want to get held up thinking, what is perfection? We want to say, if we can move the ball forward today, let's do it. And also at the same time, if there's no perfection, it means there's almost also no mistake, right? And also, so, because we don't care, right? Like what we care about is progress. Mm -hmm. And so many times throughout the day, you'll hear someone say, hey, progress, not perfection. This didn't go the way we wanted it to. Um, the next core value is know the goal. Again, very focused on, we want to be a team of people that look to understand what the outcome is, to be intentional about that, to become self-aware and reflective and not just, I did the meeting or I did my task. And you see this again playing out often because we'll have a decision to make and maybe marketing is looking at it one way and bank ops is looking at it a different way. And as opposed to now this who's right or who has more power, it's, hey guys, let's know the goal, right? Let's step back and say, what is the goal? And let that drive how together we work. And so and a, pra a practical example of that is when we start a meeting at Quantic, we do a know the goal statement. Does everyone know what the goal of this meeting is, right? And you find oftentimes they do, but sometimes there's one person who maybe thought it was something different, right? And we want to stop and frame it up. Um, the third value is say cheese. This is one of my favorite ones. Um, it's the idea that we want to be a place where you have fun and you enjoy working, right? And so with this analogy of it doesn't matter what kind of day you're having, even if it's a bad day, if someone stops and pulls up a phone or a camera to take a picture of you and they say cheese, what do you do? You stop and smile. And oftentimes the person taking the picture smiles too when they say it. And so we want to be able to recreate that experience, you know, when you talk to employees or customers, how cool would it be if a bank actually made you smile every time you talk to it? Um, and the last value is uh, try it on. It's this idea that we want to be quick to do things, right? We want to say, hey, let's try this on together and let's not get held up in 20 hours of meetings about what should we do because oftentimes you don't know, right? And so we want to be quick to move and kind of the funny example we give here is if you're at a department store and you see a shirt up on the wall that you like, you're not going to stop and get out your phone and do 20 minutes of a pro con list about should you try it on or not, right? You're just going to try it on kind of freely, right? And we use this phrase often. And I think uh, one of the insights here that we had even lots of banks, you know, will ask us about what's it like to be a digital bank and, you know, what's it like with these millennials and how do you serve them? What do you do? And here's what we're thinking. And the funny thing is in the 18 months we've been a digital bank, we now all of our deposits come online the average age is 58. It's not the millennial, right? And this just kind of goes to that point of, we don't know sometimes, so we want to be quick to try it on. And so those are kind of the four guiding values or the four core values of Quantic. So, so I like that framework, I particularly like um, the say cheese. Um, I like the, the, the concept and, and, the, and the language that you use around that. How, how, do you, how do employees at Quantic, how are they introduced to sort of these core values and how, um, how did you sort of reach to them during the, during the crisis, like to help you with decision-making or with cohesiveness or resiliency? Yeah. So um, employees, one, when we defined our core values, it wasn't something that we said from the top down what we wanted to be. And it wasn't something from the bottom up because I think in either case, that's not authentic in many ways. Like your core values simply are what the majority of you have in common today. Right, you don't get to decide what my family's like. We're just born into it, and so we stopped and said, "What is what is unique about all of our employees, and what's largely true about all of us?" Again, maybe not everyone. We identified these, and then you know we begin in the interview process. Now we talk about it, and we have some. We've even woven them into the interview process as a way of kind of fleshing out whether you'd be a good fit or not. And then we've been building out a whole series of, of videos when you first come into Quantic that talk about them. And 
then again, we, it comes up literally every day. Um, and so for an example of how it helped us through this time of COVID, um, one, all of a sudden we found ourselves in a remote workforce like everyone and kind of that fun familiarity you have with coworkers and being in the same office space all of a sudden was gone, right? And you maybe don't spend 10 minutes having a cup of coffee getting to know what's going on in someone else's life. Well, as part of Say Cheese, one of the things we do when we start every meeting is positive focus. Everyone has to go around and say something personally or professional that was positive in their life. And when we started doing this on Zoom, for example, when we started any meeting, it was a way by which we could smile and enjoy for a moment in a stressful time and also stay connected with each other, right? And even so, I think at times I did, and I know when other people, you just wanted to be scared or you were just stressed and anxious, um, you know, but this, and you, want, you probably didn't want to do anything around say cheese, but when we implemented this, we, everyone knows like, I got to do it. It's just part of the way of life here at Quantic, right? And that's what I mean. It kind of helped pull us through when maybe at times our own willpower um, wasn't there for something like that. I also think another example, uh, when forbearance came out, right? We, we own a lot of mortgages in New York City and obviously we very quickly in, you know, realized our borrowers were in trouble. And you know, we wanted to be proactive. And so we, we immediately reached out and said, hey, if you need to defer your mortgage, you're welcome to. And at the time we kind of said, here's three different ways in which you could do this. Because frankly, there hadn't even been legislation or guidance come out about how to do this. And so as, you know, but we're, we wanted to help borrowers. And as we went through it, you know, we had to make different pivots and, you know, kind of rework some things because we didn't know what we know now about how we were supposed to handle this. But throughout that whole process, you know, the team kept saying, as did we, progress, not perfection, right? Like our borrowers needed help. We wanted to be there. We were proactive. We don't know what perfection is. And we have to remind ourselves that in so many ways we don't care because if the only thing we can care about is a constant state of progress, we will in many ways actually end up in perfection, right? And so, and just as we had to make decisions throughout about how are we going to do this or we got to pivot for that, these values helped us understand how to make decisions and they helped us stay together as a company um, in a very powerful way. Do you think your customers feel the culture? Like how do the customers resonate with some of these things? That's a great question. You know, it's something I think we will start doing more of is kind of weaving these in so that the customers experience it. But at the same time, these take our culture. That's ours, right? It doesn't necessarily mean it's for the, com the customer. They may be attracted to it. I think, you know, the oftentimes used example of Southwest, people like to fly on Southwest but that doesn't mean they necessarily would resonate with the culture of Southwest, right? It's just something that's a pleasant experience for certain people and other people don't like it. So I think it will attract customers at times and I think it will probably dispel customers at times. Um, but I think in terms of how they feel it the most, it's going to be whether they ever know it or not in the way the Quantic team interacts with them and responds to them and helps them because these values are driving this, right? Um, and they're moving like, you know, we wanted, we knew on the liability side, for example, that a lot of customers with us have CDs and maybe they needed their money. And, you know, we just said, okay, let's try this on. And we don't know if it will help or not, but we're going to just reach out to everyone and say, if you need to break your, your CD penalty free because of COVID, you could, right? And, you know, we just tried it on. And sure enough, a few people took advantage of it. I wouldn't say it was that many, but what happened was we got overwhelming feedback that that was so cool that we were doing that. And that if they, even if they were pulling their CD, you know, their commitment was I'll be back. And we've seen that happen and they've come back and brought more business over to us, right? So they felt try it on. Um, they felt the sense of progress, not perfection. And I think it, you know, whether they could ever use those words or not, I don't know, but I do think they experience it. Got it. And, and I have to imagine through this trying time, you know, all cultures evolve. Um, how do you see sort of the tenets and the framework that you described, I guess, carrying Quantic, you know, into the future? So uh, what, one of the most informative books for me or authors on this topic is a guy named Patrick Lencioni. Uh, he wrote The Five Dysfunctions of the Team, but he also wrote another book called The Advantage. And the, in The Advantage, it lays out that there are six critical questions a company needs to be able to answer about itself. 
and one through four really get to kind of these, uh, this idea of the mission, the core values, these anchors. They use, use some different words than we do, if you will. But that these aspects of Quantic um, are per per perpetual. They're not meant to change. Um, you know, I think there's another in his book or his framework, he talks about there's a thematic plan, what's most important in the next six, nine, 12 months and who does what. And I think that changes with time, right? As we, as, as we morph and we do get into new products or new services. So I think how the, where the seats are configured on the bus and who sits in them and what's the, the next, you know, bus stop we're going to, that will change, but really these, the core values, what we call our strategic anchors and our mission statement shouldn't ever change. And, you know, it should live past even my time at Quantic or Steve, who's our CEO and owner that, you know, fast forward 70, 80, 90 years from now, without either of us here, Quantic is still who it was today because it's not tied to our personalities like a lot of businesses can be. It really was meant to be a way of which would attract people and unify them and be a forever thing. Got it, understood. Um, and I guess in the remaining time we have, like, what, what are your biggest priorities now? Like, you know, we've been through this, what, six months, I guess, into it. Um, how are you thinking about the future and, 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 and pointing the ship in, in, in a specific direction? So for us, we had to kind of pause our originations on the mortgage side when COVID happened, and that's come back online now. So we're really focused on kind of rebuilding that part of our business um, I think on the deposit side, a lot of what we've been doing these last two years is laying the framework of the, the foundation we needed to roll out a series of new products, um, probably in 2021, that we're really excited about and tied this idea of innovative deposits. We'll be rolling out four or five checking accounts that have never been seen or done before in the industry. Um, and so I'm personally very excited about that and um, helping make sure that the culture, I think is the other last piece of what, how we're thinking about is we have already had employees call us. I even had someone call me this weekend um, who wasn't an employee and said, I work at another bank. This is what I do. I love your core values. I love your culture. And I want to come work for you, right? So great. And we actually signed a job offer yesterday with him. Um, but I think it's great to talk about this. And we, well, it's real in many ways. You know, part of what I see my job is, is to be the chief reminder officer, right? And just to take take this and really just drive it home every day and how do we make culture so much more than just lip service and words but practically a living breathing piece of the organization patrick sells quantic bank thanks for joining us at the resilience conference thanks zach good to be here